Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Seen and Heard. Today, I'm here with Lisa Gazzara, acclaimed painter and photographer. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about your work, some big moments, things like that? Sure. I think the I've had two recent big moments. Um, Maya Rudolph has a new show called Loot Neat. on Apple TV, and one of my big pieces is in a scene there, wow. featured, which is really nice. I've been meaning to watch that show. Yeah, it's actually quite pleasant. It's really lovely. Awesome. It's a, it's I love a, it's, a, it's a happy, happy show. Um, and then uh, that movie about the heiress that was faking to be an heiress, um, Inventing Anna. I love a good scam. She is explaining in a scene how incredibly gifted Cindy Sherman, the photographer, is. She does a lot of self-portraits. Mm -hmm. And they're in this big gallery in New York City. And right next to the Cindy Sherman is my photograph. Oh my god! With a wall tag with my name on it. Oh wow! So wait, did, does that mean you just lucked out with that? Well, I work with a uh, a, a, a gallery in North Hollywood. Okay. Right and here. Yeah, right here, right around the corner. Actually, how, how have I not been there yet? Your mom has been there. Oh, I have to go with you. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a huge airplane hangar, and uh, it's called Art Pick. Okay. And she supplies original artwork to set decorators, designers, and architects. Neat. And for magazine shoots. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with her for probably 15 years now. And um, she shows people my work and, uh, and other artists as well. Right. And they usually pick my work uh, so that it is featured, which is really nice. That's amazing. I also had work on Mad Men for three seasons. Oh, my gosh. Roger Sterling's office, when they went from sort of the old-fashioned look of the 50s and they went into the progressive sort of pop era right three of my paintings were in his office oh, that's really cool and so did they choose you because they knew that you kind of represented that style or they yeah uh, interesting enough the um the set decorator claudia Daduel Daduel uh really saw that my work was very much abstract expressionist of that period mm -hmm. um in fact one of the pieces has an r in it which nice. I never noticed. Oh my gosh. And it was in Roger's office. Right, cool. So that was part of her impetus. So wow. she thought it just really worked seamlessly with that era. Wow, which there's was a so, huge compliment. so much thought put into set direction like that. Right? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. So I was honored, and then the Huffington Post also interviewed me. That's incredible. And that was all over, and I was on a bunch of newspaper covers wow. across the country. So that yeah, was fun. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, the Huffington Post article was the woman behind the men on Mad Men. Oh, neat. Yeah, so it was kind Very of cool. Very cute. Yeah. So if other um, artists wanted to have opportunities like that, like how, how does that happen for them? Well, it depends on um, the film industry in your state, town, city. Right. Um, and you would just reach out to um, different, art. they're called art houses, uh -huh. and see if they were looking for more art for whatever. I mean, like I said, my work doesn't only just appear on film and TV. Sometimes it's in magazine. Mm. Sometimes uh, they rent it to, just for an office for a month or so. What about staging and things like that? Yes, I did. I did a year's worth of staging with Harlow Interiors wow. as well. They yeah. they bought five. They were decorating five huge mansions in L.A. Amazing. And so I packed up like fifty pieces, and they took them and staged all, all these. Sorry if this is tacky, but does that kind of stuff pay well? Well, what it is is it's, it's, it's exposure. It's exposure right? with, with the staging, it's exposure because they do. if you work with a reputable stager and they've done an impeccable job, a lot of people in that money price, price point will buy the entire mansion oh. as decorated. Wow. So that's what you sort of hope for. That's incredible. Yeah. Did that happen? No. Uh, no. But it's a risk that you take. Yes, of course. Okay, cool. I mean, so yeah, now I want to really talk about your art so people understand. Um, you do photography and painting, and it has this kind of really cool juxtaposition, um, this duality, because your your uh, your photography is mostly black and white, yes. right? And it's kind of stark and intense and then uh, in its own way. And then the abstracts that you do are so um, explosive and in a sense in that way. So how do you kind of confront that duality and, and work with that? So uh, I like to say uh, that we all have a left brain and a right brain, right? Yeah. And one side is, for me is the painter. Right. And that is the side that really touches my soul. It's a very mystical, magical thing to paint. It's also harder than hell. Yeah. It's not all, you know, roses and unicorns. Yeah. 
Um, so there, there, I will wake up one day and just have this strong, strong need to paint. Yeah. Probably the way you write music. Like, yes. I need to write this song now. Yes. Um, and then I kind of need to separate myself from the painting from time to time, and then I'll pick up my camera. Nice. And that's the other side of my brain, which is much more logical. It's more technical. But within the search for a great photograph, I am still looking for the magical and the mystical. Right. Because I grew up in a very small town, surrounded by nature, absolutely beautiful. And where, where did you grow up? Westford, Massachusetts. Okay. Oh, nice. A little town near Concord, Massachusetts, where the Re Revolutionary War started. Wow. Um, so having moved to L.A. in 1986, it was such a stark difference. I'm sure. I mean... My paintings switched from being horizontal, like a New England landscapes, yes. to vertical, like Beechwood Canyon. Wow. Just as one weird sort of way my brain was fathoming this new landscape. Yeah. But with the, with the black and white photography, I shoot infrared, which is a very painterly way of using digital cameras. Mm -hmm. In fact, you just never quite know what it's going to turn out like. Whoa. So it's very similar in nature to my search for beauty and creativity, uh, but it is not quite as soul quenching as painting. Right, and why do you think that is? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, I think because I'm separated from my subject by a machine, right? right? This yes. camera that yes. I put in front of my face. Right. However, when I paint, I often even just paint with my hands. I don't even use brushes. It's a very intimate, gestural, spontaneous expression. So I'm not, I'm not separated by a camera or, a, or a, a visual field. I'm actually in the painting myself, right. physically. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, okay, on that note, I guess, um, I wanna know about your inspirations. So, I mean, you've obviously been doing art for a very long time. How long has it been? Well, technically, um, I think I was four, okay. and my dad, um, I tell this story all the time, but my dad came home with a huge box of Crayola crayons. Oh my gosh. And you know, usually you give kids five crayons yeah. and a blank piece of paper. Sure. He brought home this huge magical box of crayons, yeah. and I just, I remember being four and going, I didn't even know there were that many colors in the world. Wow. Right? That's and I cool. Definitely, if my affinity straight to uh, forest green and deep, deep blue. Oh, nice. And I just remember that I just was so in love with the colors. And is that still, those colors still resonate with you a lot? Yeah, I'm actually doing a whole series with blue paint right now. Nice. Not quite green, but the, I did a series of green last year. The black and blue, or yes. the black and blue series. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank I love you. it. Um, so so uh, to, to answer your question, sorry, I'm really inspired by beauty and color and light. Nice. Yeah. I love that. What about other artists? Yeah, my favorite artist of all time is Joan Mitchell. Oh. She was a second generation. Um, not Joni Mitchell. Not Joni Mitchell, yes. although Joni Mitchell is a great artist as well. Yeah. Um, Joan Mitchell was a second generation uh, abstract expressionist that worked out of 9th Street in New York. Oh, okay. And um, she later moved to France, which I would love to do. And she was in love with Monet's paintings. In fact, she bought a property right near Giverny where Monet painted all the water lilies. Oh, beautiful. So she's a very abstract oh, that painter. that area is gorgeous. Oh, it's so, it's just breathtaking there. Wow. So um, she really inspires me, especially when you think about the time she was creating abstract art. Number one, there were very few women accepted, let alone looked at. Mm -hmm. And also, it was the 1930s and 40s. Mm -hmm. So... Her work today still is still resonates wow. perfectly wow. in a modern art world. So she's my favorite. Interesting. Jackson Pollock because mm -hmm. he's an action painter. Right. And I do action painting as well. Nice. Um, so can you say what action painting is? So action painting is literally throwing paint. Yeah. Okay. You're throwing it or using brushes or using your hands or using sticks. You usually water down the paint so that it's very fluid, mm. and you literally throw it and so see cool. what happens yeah i love that. there's two modern painters right now that i just love in fact they're on instagram it's martha youngworth okay she was born in 1940 cool. amazing painter 
Um, I've been studying her paintings, especially because she does paintings with drips, <laughs> like nice. I do. Yes, I love that. Um, what's the other painter I love so much? Uh, Rita Ackerman. Mm. Rita Ackerman has an amazing show uh, that's going around the world right now. And Joan Mitchell is at the Tate Modern right now. Nice. Yeah. So the action painting, that's so fascinating to me. It's just like, because it's like your action is being captured on that canvas then. And it's whatever you're feeling at that time when you're doing that action. And that's literally just getting transferred onto there. Yeah, it's a very physical, sensual experience. Yeah. Now, p please know that I was a very realistic landscape painter for years. Right, right. I'm a classically trained painter. Right, yeah. I took my first painting lesson at 13 years old. Yeah. And I was painting cows in a field right. <laughs> in New England. Yeah. So I went through all the necessary steps. And then I went to UMass South Dartmouth. And I learned... Um, how to, to render, you know, nudes, landscapes. We had multidisciplinary things. We had to do etching and silkscreen and sculpture, all, all, all of it. Yeah. So the, not to say that there aren't great abstract painters that aren't classically trained, because right. they exist. Mm -hmm. But I actually went the route of pure, romantic, realistic landscapes. And when I came to um, Beechwood Canyon in Hollywood, I went completely abstract. Interesting. So does it drive you kind of insane when people aren't classically trained and then they become, like could, if I decided tomorrow that I was going to be an abstract artist, <laughs> um, would that be like really lame? No, because I think we all have an inner critic. Yeah. And we all know what beauty is. Yes. And we all know what balance is. Yes. So making a good painting incorporates being visually attuned to balance, good composition, good colors, yeah, and expression. Right. So it doesn't really matter if you're classically although trained, I although it helps. Although people who are aesthetically challenged. Yeah. What about those people? Well, you know, I think that everyone, and especially in this country, since it's so not really, since it's so not really um, taught, Right. Art isn't in everyone's home. People go to Pottery Barn or, you know, they buy posters online, which is fine, right. right? Yeah. But there are so many great gifted artists that are young, inexpensive, and talented that I think you just sort of have to put your toe in the water. Wait, and inexpensive? You mean inexperienced? No, inexpensive and inexperienced. Oh. But it doesn't mean their work is invaluable. Inexpensive meaning that's how they sell their work. Yes. Inexpensive, I see. Yes, yeah. because when you start out, you can't put a five, ten thousand yeah. right. price tag right. on your work. Yes. You have that's to true. earn that. Yes. Yeah, that makes me think of this guy, Alec Monopoly. Do you know who that mm -mm. is? He's like a pop artist. Okay. And he just put kind of like I don't know, was it like Scrooge McDuck on everything? And oh, like a I bunch know of that guy. Bills yeah. And, stuff. and I'm pretty sure he comes from money or something. I'm sure he does. <laughs> and it's sort of like, I don't even know how the licensing of that would work, right, first of all. But like, it, it, I don't know. I, I guess it just seems odd to me because it's, where is that inspiration coming well, from? Well, you have to go back to Andy Warhol. Yeah. And Andy Warhol was the first person to really make pop art. Yeah. In other words, he just took everyday objects and he turned them into masterpieces just by making them huge and big and, you know, doing silk screen prints of the Campbell's soup can. Right. So he's the original commercial artist. He was also a great illustrator. He was an amazing illustrator. He was classically trained. Right. Um, people that, you know, put ducks in their work or tape bananas to the wall. Yeah. It has its... It has its meaning to them, and if it resounds with people, great. Yeah, I'm doesn't resound with me. Yeah, I'm proud of them for uh, making a, a splash in the world. Yeah, if they last, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I think a lot of times it's like their message, right? It's their statement, like Scrooge McDuck, capitalism. Yes, like, screw it, right? And I get right. that. Um, I think more what I was thinking is that person's probably not classically trained. I don't know, but like just decided to maybe be an artist I don't know and this person is just an example I have no idea about him to be mm -hmm, honest mm -hmm. but like can anybody just be a pop artist then if they have a message well again people are attracted to beauty composition yeah and good draftsmanship yes and if you have those without going to art school great yeah it's rare yeah sure um but I'm just of the ilk that Everyone should embrace art, period. And you find your way. And if you're an artist and you're creating something and it does pick up 
in culture and it is popular good for you yes that's not what i do right but i think there's a place for all of it okay so yeah i did want to talk more about like your process and and your paintings and not just get on this wild tangent about sure is it okay to do this is it okay to do that but um you're reading that book by rick rubin right now on the creative process on the creative process yes and there's a quote and it's something like the act of creation is an attempt to enter a mysterious realm longing to transcend and um like how does that resonate with you so i think initially when i got my first box of crayons it just transported me right it wasn't about my sister who was crying who was a baby or my mom who was stressed out because she was 19 oh my god you know wow. and um i think that it, it really uh settled me mm-hmm. and it hyper focused me so that was a wonderful introduction into the process um for me painting is extremely spiritual because I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where I go when I'm doing it. And sometimes it's almost like I'm in a trance and those are very rare times. Yeah. And when I come out of that trance, I look at what I've done and I don't know how I did it. Yeah. And so I think Keith Richards talks about, it doesn't come, his music doesn't come from him. He channels it from a higher place. That's really cool. And I very much feel the same way about art, yeah. about painting mostly, mm-hmm. not as much about photography. Although when I do see something and I'll say to my husband, pull over, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's that magical moment, yeah. which is similar to what, what I, I try to do with my painting. Um, there was this time when I moved to Beechwood Canyon in the late 80s and a friend of mine had just had a baby. Mm-hmm. And I was so in love with her and the baby and the whole process and the mother and child. And I went down into my garage. Let's not call it a studio. It was a dark, (laughs) danky garage. And I just started uh, using paint with my hands and just throwing it on this large piece of paper. And I disappeared. Yeah. And when I came out of that, I had painted a mother and child. Oh, that's incredible. Very abstract. That's what ended up on uh, in Roger uh, uh, Roger Sterling's office. Oh, neat. That's the one that has an R in it, but it's actually a mother and child. Oh, how cool. So that was the very first time I quote unquote disappeared. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just totally being in the creative stream of mm-hmm. consciousness. Mm-hmm. And I've always tried to get back there yeah. and I have accomplished it on several occasions. But a lot of it is just darn getting in there and getting dirty. I think some people use drugs to get there. I think there's a lot about like, like why there are so many musicians who are songwriters who use drugs to get to that place where it's kind of like sure. you're freeing your mind, right? Maybe you're shutting off your like frontal lobe or something and mm-hmm. to an extent, you know, kind of just um, turning your brain off in a way to get that channel yeah. that's coming from somewhere else. Yeah, I think I think the unfortunate part about the creative process is it is so intangible and it's so unpre- unpredictable. Yes. But you have to get through. I once did a painting really stoned and it sucked. <laughs> I thought it was the best thing in the world. I was up until two. I was doing this painting and I just I was just smoking, you know, cheap pot in the 80s, yeah. not the kind of pot that's around today. <laughs> And I went to bed and I was so proud of myself. Yeah. And then I got up in the morning and I went, oh my God, it is such crap. Oh my God, that's And so I funny. said, I will never do that again. Yeah. I will never drink I will never drink and paint. I will never do drugs and paint. Yeah. I mean, nice to have the experience. Sure. I dropped acid once. I didn't paint while I dropped acid. Yeah. But it was a magical experience like you're describing. Yeah. Um and so it's it's like a tiptoeing and a trust that you're going to be able to open that channel yeah without drugs right just by going through what you're doing yeah so that's incredible i love that response thank you um so i think your paintings are mostly known for like well i think there's a lot of energy in them right and like sort of an energetic like style um, so you, and you also have some different techniques that you use, like in your process, mm-hmm. something about like a long wooden dowel yeah, stick. Dow- oh, that's what you'd call a dowel. Yeah. How, how do you, how did, how did you develop that? So my husband who is off camera is a, is an amazing carpenter 
contractor. Oh, nice. And his studio was next to mine. And he was throwing out all these long, slender pieces that he cut off of a molding. I believe it was molding. And they were very flexible and very long. Yeah. And so I pulled one out of the trash and I dipped it in paint and I did that. And I was like, oh my God, that is so beautiful. That's so cool. I mean, it's not like I actually, it has its own life. Yeah. I give it energy, but it has its own life. And the, um, the gestures and the lines that come out of that accident or that piece of wood, uh, they're just, they're amazing to me. Yeah. And they're very inspirational. Yeah. So I will often start um, paintings that way. I will just start um, dipping sticks. I also paint with um, tree branches. Okay, cool. And I dip them in the paint and then I fling it, flick it, scratch it, draw with it. And part of that process came from when I was in college. Uh, they gave us, um, I think it was a chunky pencil. Mm -hmm. And they didn't allow us to put it in a pencil sharpener. They made us carve it, oh. the, the lead, with, yeah. with an X-Acto knife. Cool. Because it's random. It's yeah. never going to be perfect. Oh, that's so cool. And then they it gave us... it more us, unique. Yeah. Yeah. And each person does it differently, yes. right? Even though we all have the same instrument. Oh, I love this. So then we had a piece of paper that they had us buy, which was like, at the time, probably a $17 piece of rag paper. Wow. Very thick, very rich. Yeah. And they said, okay, bring that, and we're going to supply the pencils, bring a razor blade so you can cut the thing. And then when we got there, they said, now take that $17 piece of paper, which in 1990 or 1978 was very expensive yeah. as an art student. Yeah. And they said, throw it on the floor and step on it. Oh, my gosh. This is not a precious process. This is a messy process. Yeah. Now, pick it up off the floor, put it on your easel, and make every single type of line and scratch you can with that pencil. Wow. I want, every, I want thin, thick, bold, delicate, and learn that all of these things that you do with this pencil, these are all the possibilities of you being able to express yourself. Wow. And so it's the same with the pieces of wood or even with my hand. I'll often just hit my hand on the canvas or the paper. I'll dip it in paint. Um, and so that was very... This art school sounds awesome. Yeah. At the time, it was called Southeastern Massachusetts University, but okay. since has been bought by uh, UMass. Oh, okay. And is on the Cape uh, in Massachusetts. Oh, incredible. And I did have some amazing teachers. Wow. I had amazing teachers at UMass, too. Did you? But that's UMass Am Amherst. Amherst, yeah, yes, I went course. to Hampshire, so I got to go to oh, UMass, nice. too. So I, I love those schools. Um, yeah, it's an incredible process. So it ends up becoming a, a subtractive process yeah. because what you need to do, or I need to do, is fill the canvas with as many splashes and scratches and accidental marks that I can. And then something emerges from it and I start to see a composition. Mm -hmm. And I start to see something that I recognize. Right. And then I start taking white paint and painting things out. Right. So that the expression of the lines or the splashes become more articulate. Mm -hmm. And then it's just trying to not overwork it, mm. trying not to subtract too much. Right. Very so. cool. Awesome. So um, I guess I'm wondering, too, like there's um, you, you've had um, celebrities who have your have your work. And a couple of those are like Bruce Dern and um, and Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence. Lawrence yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, incredible. So. How, how does how do opportunities like that come about, like celebrity opportunities? Um, or, or does it just happen organically? And then, and then what does that do for you? Like, how does that impact your career? So I was working with a publicist. We were actually doing a trade. Mm -hmm. And she needed um, headshots mm -hmm. and a book, uh, a, a book portrait. Nice. And I said, great. I said, what can you, what can you trade for me? Mm -hmm. You know, because even at that, at that point, which was probably 10 years ago, nobody really heard of me too much mm -hmm. I mean you can google me now and there's lots but I was still building my yeah. um repertoire then and she said you know what I'm in charge of the Oscar bags gift bags wow and I want to put your one of your portfolios in the Oscar gift bag that's incredible and so I put together a book of all my work paintings and photographs 
and Jennifer Lawrence got one and Bruce Stern, everybody got one. Right. And they called me and said, I want the, Bruce Stern's wife wanted a painting wow. that I did. And Jennifer Lawrence is interior designer and she chose a photograph for her Louisville home. Oh my gosh. And isn't it amazing to see like who's attracted to your work? That must yeah. be so fun. Oh, it's thrilling. To see who's attracted to your work. I like, was also terrified. Oh, wow. Of putting my portfolio of artwork, a printed book, oh. and having all these really successful, right? Top of the game, Academy Award nominated people seeing my work. Well, I'm just looking at you like you're crazy because I don't know why you would be afraid. Oh, I was terrified. So I was so terrified. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say to any artist, no matter how old you are or how young you are, it doesn't matter when you start. You have to do as much as you can in many different ways. The, the, the era of a gallery signing you, mm -hmm. nurturing you, yeah. giving you money, mm -hmm. giving you a studio, mm -hmm. and giving you a show of your art, that's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen anymore. So you need your fingers in a lot of pies. Mm -hmm. So the um, art pick that rents and, and, and sells my work to film and TV is one avenue. Um, I also was a commercial real estate photographer. Nice. I was a publicist, a, pu a publicity photographer, Rogers and Cowan. Oh, wow. I shot all sorts of events. I photographed Robert De Niro and Shirley MacLaine and all these different people at events. Nice. Um, that part, partially part happened because my father, when he realized I wanted to go to college for painting, he gave me a camera and said, yeah, but do this too. Yes, smart. smart you, guy. You're not, I don't yeah. know about selling your paintings totally for a long good. time, but yeah. at least you can make a living as a commercial yeah. photographer. This is actually my last interview just told a story about his dad giving him a camera. Really? Yeah, it's really um, cute. I love the, the yeah. progression. That's so nice. So that's part, partly why I've always been able to do both. But there's so many avenues for photographers and painters and sculptors now, and there's so many opportunities online. Mm -hmm. Even on Instagram, I've entered contests on Instagram that I've gotten into curated shows. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, but you have to be selective. I mean, there's so many, um, it's sort of like um, in, a, in the acting world, they have all these seminars that actors can take and you pay them $150 to learn how to be in front of a camera. Sure. Fine, great, doesn't necessarily lead to a job. Mm -hmm. In the art world, in the photography world, I always make sure when I enter contests and competitions that they actually have a gallery. Right. Not that it's just online. Yes, smart. So you need to be discerning. Selective, yeah. Um, my paintings are very big and heavy. I'm not going to submit my paintings to a place in New York unless they're including shipping. Yeah. So there's all these things you have to learn as you go. Yeah. Um, but just what, whatever creative opportunity presents itself to you, just go for it. And do you think that these kind of big name people, not necessarily a celebrity, but you know somebody that people might recognize, um, them having your work, is that some sort of endorsement in a way for people that don't really understand art? Sure, I mean, you know, everybody wants to be sure that they're buying or being a part of something that's good. Yeah. And you know, in our culture and in the advertising world, a celebrity endorsement is huge. Yeah. People listen to that, mm -hmm. you know, as an influencer. It's sure. the same thing. If yeah. you say that this is a good product, I'm going to believe you. Yeah. So, no, it's, it's, I think those things, I don't think it's completely necessary to have a celebrity endorsement, but if you have one, use it. Right. Yeah. I agree. Okay. So, okay, we'll move on from celebrities, but um, I'm wondering about, like, the exhibitions that you've been a part of. Um, galleries you've been a part of um just shows i guess um what would have been some standout moments for you so i did a portfolio interview um at the palm springs photo festival probably 10 years ago maybe 12 years no 10 years ago and one of the people that was going over people's portfolios was one of the curators at the annenberg uh, space for photography which was in century city oh amazing it's now closed oh but she invited me to display my work along with other artists on these huge screens nice. in the Annenberg. Wow. I mean, they were probably, what, 25 feet long by 20 feet tall? They were the huge projected Incredible. screens. And I had done a series called Surreal Escapes that were all um, nature-based. Mm -hmm. 
And I got invited to that just by doing a portfolio interview. Wow. Which was really a big thing. That's really cool. Um, a friend of mine had a show at the SFO Museum, very famous photographer named Guy Webster. And I met the curators for that. And after his show was over and, and all was done, I submitted my work to them. Cool. And, and they knew me personally because yeah. I had worked hand in hand with them. So it was a very easy thing. It wasn't like, you need to look at my work. It was like, hi, it's Lisa. Listen, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer too. Would you like to see this work? Wow. And that was a wonderful solo show at the San Francisco Museum, which is in the airport. So I'd like to say tens of thousands of people saw my work. I'm sure. Yeah. Which was That's really nice. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. That wow. was very big. Um, okay. So just a couple more questions. Like I know, like just going back to your process and everything, like you've said that painting kind of soothes your soul and everything and, and heals you. Have there been particular moments where you've needed to turn to it or it's made just a huge difference in your life? Yeah, I mean, you know, we all have trauma, right? We all have experienced trauma in childhood, in growing up, in high school, car accidents, um, ex-boyfriends that raked us over the coals. And I can't initially paint when I'm upset. Mm -hmm. It's like it needs a little distance and time. Um, in fact, when my dad died, he was killed in a car accident. I couldn't paint for five years. Oh, God. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. He was in perfect health. That was really tough. And everything I tried to paint turned into mush. Yeah. And I later read that Lee Krasner, when Jackson Pollock died, she was an insomniac. Wow. And when she painted, she painted at night. And she said, I painted for a solid year, and it was all mud. So it's just, there, there needs to be sort of a passage of time mm -hmm. between events, depending on the trauma. Obviously, death is the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a, a great deal of energy and um, anxiety. Yeah. I just do. I think yeah. a lot of creative people do. And the painting just, ah, yeah. it's like a tranquilizer. It's just like, it, it just takes all of this unexpressed emotion and I put it somewhere, yeah. and, and then I have the best night of sleep I can ever have. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. I love that. Thanks. I know when I finish a song, I'm just like, I'm on cloud nine. <sighs> of course. You know, it's, yeah. it's the best feeling. Um, so I want to get into like some recent stuff. So you have this new series, Black and Blue, and then I was really drawn to, I think it was either Black and Blue 2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... That it's stunning. It Thank you. Stunning. That that those actually black and blue two and three sold, and they're with a collector in San Francisco. Oh right wow, now. incredible! Um, I I started them during COVID. Okay. Um, because it was such a rough time. Yeah. We were all kind of scared. Of black and, and blue. And, yeah, black. Oh, literally black and blue bruises, yeah. and you know we were all sort of like walking zombies, and we never even saw each other because we were told to stay home. Yeah. So blue, just yeah. like when I discovered Midnight Blue with my crayon box, has always been very calming to me nice so um in fact i just bought a bunch of new new blue paint different shades that i can play with in this series i've shifted from the black and blue series to the lake series but they're black and blue as well okay um because i've moved up to a lake in central california Beautiful. and again the water is so calming and inspiring i'm sure and inspiring yeah. so yeah i've got this brand new series the last two pieces i did are 60 inch by 60 inch canvases mm -hmm. and um I have, I have, I think, eight more to do. Incredible. And I keep saying, it, within the year, I will have a show with these eight to ten paintings. Are you mostly inspired by nature, do you think? Yes. Yes, yes. I grew up in, uh, on the woods in yeah. a little tiny town, and we built tree forts, and we went skinny dipping in lakes, and we picked blackberries, and there were crickets. And, and do you think people bringing your art into their home can kind of feel a sense of that? I've had people stand in front of my paintings when they didn't know that I did them. Uh -huh. And there's two funny things that have happened because of that. Because I used to just exhibit with my last name. Uh -huh. Because we know there's ramp rampant sexism in most industries, uh, especially yes. in the art industry. Wow. And I've had people literally argue in front of my paintings trying to decide if it was possible that a woman made them. Whoa. Twice in my career. Wow. And I've come up and gone, excuse me, those are my work. And they're like, 
what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this blonde girl did this energetic, crazy piece? Yeah. That's so upsetting. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to shock them. Yes. I like that part. Yeah, that's a good part. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the Oh, question? it's okay. Sorry. So um, I guess it was just like, I was thinking about, since you're inspired by nature and everything. Oh, yes, it's yes. Like, I, would, I would feel like, you know, if I brought one of your pieces into my apartment, that I was taking kind of a little bit of that nature with me or that feeling that comes from nature. Yeah, I've been told that people feel calm in front of my work. Yeah. Um, I actually worked with a spiritual teacher who said that my work helps people heal. Oh, it's awesome. Which is amazing because he didn't know anything about art. Yeah. He just wasn't that guy. But when he saw my work, he said, yes, these paintings will heal others. That's incredible. And that's such a wonderful thing to hear. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I love the Black and Blue series. Um, also, a couple of them that I was really attracted to, and I don't know how old these ones were, but one was Flight and one was Vortex. Yes, those were done with the sticks. Oh, with the sticks, yes. I love that. Yes, I, I love those pieces too. In fact, one of those series is what's on Loot, the show Loot. No way. Yes, oh, cool. yes. There's a, 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 a piece of that series uh, on Loot. Um, Are all of those paintings gone? Gosh, no, the one on loot is still being rented. Right. You okay. know, I, I, this is a wonderful thing about Where working. are Flight and Vortex? They're all at the gallery in, in, uh, at Art Pick in North Hollywood. Incredible. They go out all the time. I bet. They go out all the time. So when they're at like that space, what if somebody wants to buy them? They can. Okay. Yeah, the Art, Art Pick has the rental price per week mm -hmm. because a lot of, you know, people need it on a set for a week. Right. Um, they also have the sale price if yes. they want to buy it outright, which is what happened with Mad Men mm -hmm. because they wanted it for three seasons. So it was oh, cheaper, cheaper to buy them <laughs> than to rent them for three seasons. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what about what you have coming up? Um, oh, shows? so I have in two shows right now. I was in one show just at the beginning of summer. Um, it was an online show with the A. Smith Gallery. That was a photograph from my infrared series. Um, I have five pieces at Bergamot Station at a gallery called Gallery 12, which is gallery spelled the French way with X11, Roman numerals. I have five pieces of trees, photographs of trees there. All of them are infrared photographs. Amazing. So just to briefly describe infrared, the process is very magical because I never know how they're going to turn out when I'm shooting them until I get them into Photoshop and I start manipulating them a little bit. Um, so say if you're looking at a tree, yeah. well, the leaves are absorbing all the heat from the sun, right? Right. So they go brilliant white. Oh, that's gorgeous. And the sky, which doesn't have heat, it's just jet black. Mm -hmm. So it's very sort of um, Ansel Adams in a different way in that they're very rich blacks, very bright whites, and very subtle grays. So there's this real cool spectrum that you're getting invited into when you look at them. Yeah. So I had one person come up to me and say, how did you get all the leaves white? Oh my God. <laughs> did you spray paint them? And this is a 250 year old tree in the middle of a field. And I'm like, no, no, no. Oh God. That is the technology of infrared film as it registers the, the heat off an object, not the light. Wow. So skin goes ashen white because it's so warm, cool. yeah. right? Yeah. Trees, leaves go ashen white. So it's really, it's a really fascinating, but anyway, those shows are at, those shows are up, that shows up until August 31st at Bergamot Station. And then I'm in a show in South Carolina at the South Carolina Center for Photography. And I have a piece in a show curated by this wonderful person, Aileen Smithson. And it's a black and white photo of a friend of mine that I did back in the 90s from the neck down. Oh, wow. It's a, 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 a really kind of timeless photograph. And, that tends to get a lot of, people tend to like that a oh, lot. I'm sure, yeah, yeah. timeless photographs are great. Um, I guess I want to know one more thing. Okay. Um, how do you tell people, how do you explain to people who think that they don't understand art, how to understand it? I've brought a lot of friends with me to museums. Okay. And I tend to be very fast in museums. Uh -huh. I don't waste any time. Me too. I'm like that. Right? Yeah. It's like, I like that. I'm going to go stare at that. Mm -hmm. I like that. I don't. I like yep. this. Not mm -hmm. that it's good or bad. It's yeah, just no, you're very attracted. Discerning. Yeah. You're very attracted to certain things. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. How does this make you feel? Yeah. What do you think it is mm -hmm. if it's an abstract painting? Do you like that portrait of that person? Yeah. You know, do you, does it make you feel good? Yeah. 
does it make you feel agitated? Which can be just as good, right? right? Yeah. Um, I think it's purely instinctual. I think I think everybody again has an ability to, to discern beauty and to and to be attracted to beauty. Yes. In whatever form that is, even if it's like you know a disturbing photograph, of S and M photograph. Yeah. But sure. is it does that does that spark something in your head? Yeah go for it yeah so i just tend to just try to tell people just just walk around and find something you like and let's talk about why you like it that's really cool yeah and then it's it's not gobbledygook it's not art history it's not art speak there's it's not necessarily just, wrong answers no no yeah. wrong answers no yeah because there are no wrong feelings no god no yeah i love that okay so where can people follow you uh on instagram lisa gazara awesome and I have a, web, a, a, a storefront website that has all my career updates, and that's gazaraarts.com. Perfect. Um, it has uh, all my collections of photographs and paintings from the last 20 years, 30 years probably. Um, and just Google me. Amazing. Lots of nice interviews I've been able to be a part of like this one. Yay. And they all ask different questions, so it's, all, it's always fun. I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. I appreciate your time and your talent as well. Oh, thank you. You're welcome.